I'll go through our text, and then I'll pray, and I'll talk. James chapter 4. Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then, poof, vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, your boast, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are very heavy words from your brother, whether older brother, younger brother, your half-brother, James. Lord, help us to examine these words and understand them in the context that they are given. James has a heart for the people he is speaking to because now he knows the heart of God and how God feels about humanity, how, how God feels about him personally. So he's sharing this with them. He's challenging them. But he's also challenging us, Lord. He's challenging us to take a deep look at our American selves, our, our, our human self, to see what is it that's brewing inside. What's, what's not quite right? How have we not taken in the gospel message completely? And, and where is it still hurting and pained in our lives? Lord, for this to happen, we need your spirit. Your word's already been delivered. We need your spirit working through that word to convince our hearts that something is not right, but then also convince our hearts about the gospel. So work in us today. For the glory of your name we pray. Amen. This particular message, as I see the book of James, James is getting to be a heavier and heavier hitter. He's, he's pouring on more and more emphasis on the idea of what does your faith look like on the ground? What does it look like? What is your living faith? Because how you live your life, how you express yourself towards your family and your business, um, towards your children, your friends, your, your fellow church members, everything you do in life, all your attitudes, all your words, even your thoughts, reflect how deep has the gospel gone? Because the deeper the gospel message goes, the more it affects everything about our life. And James has been talking from the very beginning of the book, uh, this particular point, this particular point. He talks about patience earlier on. He talks about uh, being uh, prone to what other, other people's opinions just a week and, and two weeks ago. It says all of these things are an indicator that the gospel hasn't settled in on its deepest levels. So here in the book of James, especially in, in this particular portion, the end of four and the beginning of five, he really wants to nail down something on the topic of pride or identity. So I'm going to start with that idea of identity. Who are you? What is your identity? What is your identity? I walked into a room of one of our members this week, and I, I caught a glimpse of what their identity was based on. Because when we hear the topic, or the, the question, what's your identity? What's your identity based on? Who are you? Who are you? Oftentimes our, our thoughts go to, well, how are my kids doing right now? Because my kids are part of my identity. How's my marriage look? How's the Dow Jones right now? That might be part of our identity. 
or our identity might even go as far back as our SAT scores in high school, whether it's five years ago or 25 years ago. Well, I got a 35 on my SAT, or whatever your score was. Maybe that's where you rest your identity. Your identity could be the, the scores you got in college or the, the teams you played on in the past or even now. We all have our identity based on something. And the reality is we all base it on performance. We all base our identity on performance. I walked into the room of this one individual, this member of our congregation, and I found out where her identity was being challenged as a Christian. So our identity as a Christian is what? I'm a child of God, bought with the blood of Christ, how precious is the blood of Christ? It has not just eternal significance, but it has universal wealth. It's, it's more expensive than anything in all of the universe. You could add up piles of gold and riches and jewels, and still the blood of Christ would be more expensive. Do you know in your head and in your heart that that is your worth to God? James comes out and says, I don't think you do yet. We'll get to those words in a little bit. Um, in, on the notes, a, a couple of things to just get us started. Modern American culture has this belief that high, and a high opinion of yourself, a uh, high self-esteem, a, a good positive identity is what makes you a better person. In fact, we've got, we've got committees in government that are all about high self-esteem. There are high self-esteem programs in schools which the main objective of them is, is to, huge, to heap huge bits of praise on children re regardless of their accomplishments. Uh, saw an example of that in uh, Pee Wee League where a kid hit a ball, clearly was out at first base, but the coach and everyone else encouraged the child to keep running around the base all the way to home plate because we don't want to damage self-esteem. In America, high self-esteem is the big issue. If you have high self-esteem, the theory is that you'll do well. Well, that's different than ancient cultures. In ancient cultures, there was a view that too high of a self-esteem actually caused harm to society that it was harmful to have too high of a self-esteem. So which one is right? Should I have a high self-esteem or low self-esteem? Which one is better? Ancient culture pushes low self-esteem. American culture pushes high. Well, social scientists have discovered that neither one really is the issue anymore. You could have high self-esteem and be very successful. You, you could have high self-esteem and be in prison because of abuse drug abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse. You can have low self-esteem and be very successful in our cultures. Many people are. It's not high self-esteem or low self-esteem, but it's a proper self-esteem. And this is, this is what James gets to. He goes right to the heart of it in these, these words from James 4 and 5, and, and, and I'm going to encapsulate it with the idea of what is the proper way, and then first deal with what's the improper way for our identity. How do, we, how do we look at ourselves in a proper way and an improper? We'll start with the improper way. Spiritual pride, the improper way, spiritual pride is this. It's the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, achieve our own sense of self-worth, and find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. Let me read that one more time. Spiritual pride, the thing that James is warning against, is the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, achieve our own sense of self-worth, and find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. And it comes out in, in five conditions here in, in James 4 and 5. And those five conditions are this. The first, busy comes up in the, the first couple of verses. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city. We're going to spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. And then in verse 16 it says, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, your busyness, 
and all such boasting is evil. You've hoarded wealth in these last days. You're self-indul- self-indulgent. It's all about busyness. That's the first thing he's saying. The first condition of spiritual pride is a continual busyness. And it's not that God doesn't want us to be busy with things. It doesn't, it's not that he doesn't want us to be active in things. But are we using that busyness to fill something inside of us, to create an identity that God doesn't want us to create? So the first is busyness. The second is empty. The second condition is empty. It comes up in verse 14. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We're empty. And God has something that he wants to fill us with, that it has to be him. The only thing that we can truly fill our our emptiness with is is him and the, the gospel message, that he loves us, that he cares about us. But the reality is, we're looking for something else to fill that. We're looking for our investment portfolio to fill it. We're looking for relationships to fill it. We want our, our spouse to fill a, a part of ourselves. But it doesn't work. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You are a mist that appears for a little while and is gone. The third is that this condition is painful. Spiritual pride is five conditions. First, busy, empty, and then painful. It's painful. This comes up at the beginning of chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. So this condition, this condition of spiritual pride where we we try to find meaning in life and self-worth, we try to make something of our own lives, apart from God, causes a busyness, is, is because of an emptiness inside of us, and it's very painful. Think about your own body. You, make, you, you give attention to those things where there is pain. You know, sitting in here this morning, uh, every one of you can kind of do a quick, a, a quick recap of your body, a quick analysis. Oh, how am I feeling? I think I'm all right. But if something's in pain, if your knee is pain, pained, if you've got a sore back, that's the thing that draws your attention. And that's what happens to our, our identity. Our identity is pained because it is empty. And because the only thing that can truly fill it is God and the good news that he loves on us and has died for us and has given us a solid identity. But if we're not filling it with him, we're going to be filled with pain. And then he goes on. Verse 2 in chapter 5. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. So the the five conditions are busy, empty, painful, and now in in verse 3, verse 2, I'm sorry, wealth has rotted, moths have eaten your clothes. It's very fragile. It's fleeting. it, it, It passes away quickly. It's here today, but it's not guaranteed it's going to be there tomorrow. That's true of anything in this world. Anything. My kids might be doing well today, and I might be able to base my identity on how they're doing today, but I don't know. I'm not guaranteed that they will be there tomorrow. Or that they will like me tomorrow. Or that they will show their appreciation to me tomorrow. They might just leave and never come back. And if that's where my identity, if that's where my self-worth is, if that's what gives me definition in life, if that's what makes up my identity, it's gone. Your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Everything on this green earth that we try and hold on to, that we try and base our identity on, disappears. And then the fifth one, probably the most dangerous of all of them, comes up in verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. It's self-destructive. Spiritual pride is the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, achieve our own sense of self-worth, and find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. 
But how do we know that we've got a problem? I'm guessing most of us are sitting here, like myself, I, I, I'm appalled that anybody would even suggest that I have an issue with spiritual pride. I don't believe that that could be the case. In fact, as I talked to this woman this week, I guess I never did explain the scenario to you. So I walked into this person's room. They had just been, they, she had just had her toes run over by one of the other residents in the home. That's a big issue, especially if, if, you're, if this person's fairly heavy in a wheelchair. But they had just had their toes run over by this person in the wheelchair. The person came into the room, started fidgeting through her mail, And how did the person react? How did this, this Christian react? How did this daughter of God react? In anger. So much anger that I didn't recognize the person when I walked into the room. They were so steaming hot about their toes being run over and their mail being fidgeted through. Okay, well, let, let's pick it apart a little bit. What's going on? What's the issue? If this person is a child of God, if they are dearly loved, it doesn't matter who runs over your toes, even though it is painful, God's going to make something good come out of this. He's going to point you ahead to the day when, yeah, you know what? Yes, this is painful, and I'm sorry it happened, but the reality is, in heaven, there's a place of no more tears, no more sorrow. You can look forward to that. Or you could take the element of pain and say, you know what, yeah, that, that is painful, but it's not as painful as what I deserve for everything selfish I have ever done. The pain that I deserve is the pain that Jesus suffered for on the cross, and I'll never get that. I'll never have to go through hell the way he went through hell because I'm a child of God by faith. Or you could think about it this way. If I'm a child of God by faith and someone does filter through my mail and, and happens to take my welfare check or whatever is coming my way and, 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 and I lose some of my personal belongings, if I am truly a child of God and God truly loves me, what's he going to do to help me get through that loss? Do you see where I'm going with this? See, when stuff comes into my life, when stuff comes into your life, when you get challenged physically, emotionally, spiritually, when you get snubbed at work, when someone, when someone ignores the good work that you've put into a project and you don't get credit for it and somebody else does, and you, you raise your fists and, and you shake and you scream and you send out emails... Do you, do you know what that's showing about your identity? Do you know what that's showing? It's showing that my identity is based on them, their reactions. It's based on, on how, my, how I'm doing in front of somebody else. That's called spiritual pride. my identity is based on how God thinks about me, the heart of God, I can ride through any snub. I can walk by any mirror, look at myself and say, yeah, okay, I'm getting fatter, I'm getting older, I'm losing hair. Ah, I'm a child of God. I, I can take praise from people and be comfortable. I can lose the accreditation of everyone and be comfortable. I can have all the wealth in the world and be comfortable. I can have no wealth and be comfortable because I'm a child of God, bought with the blood of Christ, going to heaven. Eternity is my, my home with God forever. He'll take care of me from now until the day he gets me there and then he'll definitely take care of me when I get there. What's your identity? See, what, what James is pointing out, and I really hope we all see this, is that these are purely symptoms. You know, the, uh, probably none of us could be accused of this, some of what's going on here anyway. I don't know if James could actually say this to us. Or could he? What 
James is saying is, look very carefully. What is your identity based on? We had one more passage on the screen, I believe. Here is only one of many places where it needs to be based. Galatians 3.26, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. How much does a father love his son, his daughter? How far will a father travel to show his daughter, his son, his love? Well, there's good fathers and bad fathers. The bad fathers don't give a rip. The good fathers will do everything. The good fathers will, will give up thousands of dollars to, to take care of their kids. They'll pay for college if they need to. They'll bring them back in when the children have messed up. They'll do anything they can. That's a good father. But we have not only a good father, we have the greatest father ever. Do you trust that this good father calls you a child of his and says that you're dearly loved? If you do, your life is going to reflect that. It's going to come out in how you live. A couple other passages that I added at, at the bottom. Galatians 3, you've got that. You are all children of God was the translation. Um, someday we'll talk about what the actual translation should say. It should say you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, but we don't have the time now. And then Romans 8. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because the one thing that James and Paul and Jesus himself do not want to, us to use as our identity is our sin. So let's say that list that we've got from James 4 and 5 today. Hoarding, self-indulgent, all that nasty stuff. Let's say that we've done some of that. Do you know the other problem that we have with identity? Is that we start to identify ourselves that, oh, I'm a failure. I've messed up. I've screwed up. I, yeah, I did that. Oh, my goodness, how horrible I am. God wants you to have an identity that's not based on your sin any longer. But it's based on your sin being taken away and placed on Jesus. And the robe of Jesus' righteousness placed on you. That's the gospel message. Do you believe that that's how God looks at you today? Because I, if, I, if I went deep inside of every one of your minds, everybody's got a dark secret. Agree or disagree? Everybody's got something deep and dark that they don't want anybody else in here to know. What if that identified you? What if that popped up on Monday morning when, when somehow the office got notified about my deep, dark secret? Now everybody knows. What if that identified who you are? God says, no. As my child, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't look at you that way anymore. You're not that. The old has gone, the new has come. So if you are guilty of any of these sins that we've talked about, take him to the cross. That's where you get your identity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that for myself, I know that, that I've got good days and I, I look to those successes and the performances on those good days and say, yeah, that's me. And I base my life on that. I base my identity on that. I, and it's spiritual pride in my performance. And then I go to the other extreme, Lord, and I, I have days where I fail and I mess up morally and emotionally and physically. I, I make mistakes and then I start to base my identity on that. That's also spiritual pride. Lord, forgive us when we have placed our identity on anything other than the blood 
and the righteousness that comes from Jesus. The blood says we are precious. Righteousness gets us into your family, and it, it calls us perfect. Lord, help us to base our life and our identity on that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.